Hello! In this video, we will develop Model B of our vending machine controller. If you have not watched the video for Model A, you should watch that one first. Here, we are making two small changes to the current design. First, we'll add a product select capability, and then we'll simplify the wiring with buses. Model A has an output signal that indicates whether enough money has been deposited in order to vend the product. But what does the user do next? We need to allow the user to select a product once they have paid enough. On a real vending machine, there are usually several options for the user to choose. Our new product select signal is an indication that any of the choices were pressed. There are two main considerations when we think about practically implementing this. First, pressing the product select button should be meaningless if not enough money has been paid. Second, if enough money has been paid and the product select button is pressed, this should clear the register. The user gets their product and their money is consumed. Recall that the other way the register can be cleared is if the coin return button has been pressed. That was a lot of words to represent relatively simple logic. This small logic circuit encapsulates everything that was just said. The register is cleared if coin return is pressed or if a product is selected. The product select is only effectual if the button is pressed and enough money has been paid. It is simple to add in this new logic to our base model. You can see it down here. Here is the AND gate, but instead of the OR gate, we use a NOR gate. Why is this? Simply because the clear port is active low. The reasoning just discussed doesn't change, just the result is complemented. Also note that I purposely placed two binary probes. These are the two output signals because they are what would actuate other parts of the vending machine. A high signal on the coin return line will clear the register in our controller, and at the same time, it should open the coin chute so that the user gets their money back. Similarly, a high signal from this AND gate will clear the register in our controller, and at the same time, it should open the product chute so the user gets their product. I call the product a soda in the slides, but it could be any product, even a computer science celebration kazoo. That really is the only design change occurring in Model B. However, it will be useful to replace wires with buses, as shown here. A bus is simply a bundle of wires that stays together. You commonly use buses all the time with your electronic devices in the form of cables. This image shows the ends of an Apple Lightning cable and also a mini USB cable. Notice how there are eight separate little strips of metal on the end of the Lightning cable. These all connect to different ports when plugged into a phone and are tied to separate wires within the cable. Each wire has a separate purpose like ground, voltage, data transmission, or control. So those wires maintain distinct signals all the way through the cable, but they do function together as a unit. For example, the data is meaningless if power fails. Many USB cables work in much the same way, but have just five ports and thus are generally slower at transmitting data. We represent the same thing with these buses in LogicWorks. Rather than four separate wires for their four register bits, we see one thick blue bus. Our three is still distinct from our two. We just don't see them break out from each other until the point of contact at each of these devices. Let's hop over to LogicWorks to see how to build these buses. First, we need to remove the current individual wires. I'll just click and drag over the ones I want to remove, and then press Delete. Next, I click on the Schematic tab, and then on New Breakout. The Edit Breakout window pops up. In the Add Pin box, type in the variable name and range of bits you want to use. You can use any name you want, 
but I will call mine R, short for register. The bit values will go from 0 to 3, so I then type in 0 dot dot 3. Press add and the four wire names appear. Leave the pin spacing at 2, which is the typical spacing on pre-built devices. Then press OK and the new breakout appears. I'll click once just to temporarily place it. Now we need to connect the breakout to the appropriate ports. Let's start with the comparator inputs. I click on the diagonal lines of the breakout. This is important. To move the breakout, I must click and drag from the diagonal lines. Then I drop it so the pins align. Note that, conveniently, the bit numbers on the breakout match up with the bit numbers of the comparator, 3 to 3, 2 to 2, and so on. I need another breakout on the front end of the adder. I can simply right-click on the current breakout, copy, paste, and then place. This breakout is properly aligned, even though these bit numbers don't match up. This is because of the unfortunate notation used on the adder that I mentioned last video. I need one more breakout on the register output. Unfortunately, I can't just copy and paste this one because the pin spacing is different. So, I make a new breakout with the same pin names. Schematic, new breakout, then type in R0.3 and press add. Change the pin spacing to 5. The only way I figured this out was through trial and error. Then press OK. Place the breakout anywhere temporarily. Now I need to flip this around so the pins point left. Right click on the diagonal lines, then select Flip Horizontal. Now drag the diagonal lines so the pins align with the Q outputs, not the Q bar outputs. The breakouts are all in place. Now I just draw the buses from them just like we have drawn wires before. Click on the thick lines, then move the cursor to place the buses to connect in an organized fashion. The color of the bus can be changed by right-clicking and selecting Color. I'll make this one hot pink to illustrate. Repeat this process for all remaining desired buses. I recommend one for the adder output, and the price input. And here is my completed, nicely organized circuit. Notice how I moved all of the inputs to the left side? This makes it easy to see and adjust inputs at any point. Also notice that I included hex displays on the adder output and the register output. These aren't true output signals. I'm just using them to monitor the machine's behavior. Let's see it in action. First, I clear the register by activating coin return. The register value immediately drops to zero. Now I'll add in a nickel. Why doesn't the register value change? Because a clock pulse needs to occur. I flip the clock high and the nickel is counted, so the register updates to one. But the adder output now says two. Why is that? The adder is a combinational circuit, so it has no sense of the clock. It is constantly adding the current coin input to the current register value. The coin input says 1, the register says 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. So the adder outputs 2. Why doesn't the register change to 2 then, and then 3, and then 4, and up and up forever? Because the register can only change on a positive edge of the clock. This is the beauty of synchronous circuits. Computations can be done constantly in the background, but they only cause a change once at the appropriate time. Let's add another nickel by flipping the clock switch again. Now the register updates to 2. Right after, the adder outputs 3, but that 3 doesn't clock in to the register. Notice how I'm running the simulator very slowly. That way we can visually see the register change first, and then the adder updates a little bit later. 
I'm about to add one more nickel. Keep your eyes on these two hex displays. The register will change first, and only after that does the adder change. Here it comes. Now the register displays three. I'll stop adding in coins. Now the adder also displays three. That's because three plus zero is three. I can flip the clock many times. The register value holds steady. Technically, it is updating on every clock cycle, but it is updating to the exact same value. Now I'll activate the dime, which will add in a value of two. The adder output updates. I then flip the clock, which allows the register to update. I flip the clock again, and two more is added to the register. Now I'll add a quarter. This will add in a value of five. As usual, the adder output updates first, and that value just sits there and waits for the next clock cycle. The clock cycle occurs, and the register updates appropriately. Notice that, for the first time, the vend available signal is high. This is because the register value, decimal 12, is larger than the price, 8. So, I am ready to choose my product and get my soda. Keep in mind that when I do so, I am going to lose the extra money I paid, which is 20 cents in this case. The register will simply be cleared, and no change will be remembered. Here we go. The product select button is pressed, a brief high signal is sent to the soda shoot actuator, and then the register is cleared. The machine is now ready to accept coins for the next purchase. It is really neat how elegant this design is. Three devices handle the three stages of the finite state machine model, and it provides a nearly realistic machine. But there are still improvements to be made. We'll attack the manual clock switch in our next video.